everyone. Today I'm going to explain a, a personal story that will go from chaos to domain driven design. And we only have 30 minutes, so let's go ahead. During last New Year's Eve, uh, I opened my Twitter mobile application and I start to see this kind of, of tweets where people and organizations uh, share their numbers from uh, last year. And I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. And I know that there are a lot of applications that uh, do this kind of accounting. For example, uh, GitHub uh, tells you information about your contributions. Google Maps uh, provides you information about all of your trips. But uh, there are also a lot of these kind of counters that are really distributed. For example, you can see TV shows or movies on Netflix, on HBO, on Amazon Prime. And you really don't have any aggregated counter, for example, of how many movies you have seen during last year. So I decided to start a side project related with that observation. And, oops. and that side project is all about counters, all kind of counters, counters everywhere. <laughs> So I, I want to be able to, to, ha uh, to count how many movies I've seen during last year, for example. Also to count how many counties I've, I've visited during last year. Or, for example, to count how many books I've read during last year, and so on. But it won't be only about accounting. It will be also about logging. So beyond knowing the movies count, for example, I also want to be able to know what movies I've seen, or to know where, uh, when I saw each of them. So after spending a lot of time thinking about it, I decided to name it Counters. <laughs> Very original. <laughs> so some of its alpha version use cases are the following ones. First of all, we should be able uh, to register new users and allow them to, to log in into the system, of course. Uh, we also want the users to be able to create their own counters and to increment it, <laughs> of course. Uh, we also want to be able to get statistics from the counters usage. So for example, now the increments uh, per week, per month, also to have histograms. And for example, to be able to know uh, which weekday I'm used to have more beers. Uh, and also, it will have a, a kind of a widget system. So being, being able to associate different HTML uh, widgets with your own counters. So for example, being able to count the likes from, from your blog posts or something like that. Also, as I want to earn money with <laughs> this side project, it will have a billing system that will calculate the costs of the user's usage of the system. So for example, taking it into account how many counters a user have or how many widgets a user have. And many more features will come soon. For example, for example uh, it will be very interesting to integrate this kind of platform uh, with applications like Netflix or HBO, as I said previously, to avoid to having to increment these counters manually each time you see an, a new TV show or a new movie. So now that we have clearly defined all the application use cases, we can start. Uh, hello, I'm Joan Lopez de la Franca Beltran. I'm from Barcelona. I'm also JoanJohn14 on Twitter, and I, and, or simply Joan Lopez on GitHub. I'm currently working as a software engineer on Cabify, that it's a Spanish transportation network company like Uber or Lyft. And I'm the co-founder of Friends of Go, which is a Go community uh, that, uh, which our focus is to bring in, uh, the Go programming language into the Spanish-speaking community. You can follow us on, on Twitter or on GitHub. We write some open source code. We also write some uh, blog posts 
that unfortunately are in Spanish, but we also share a lot of uh, interesting links on, on Twitter. And last but not least, I consider myself a junior speaker. Today is my second conference. So thanks for trusting me and being here. I promise you I will try to do the best, but I want to apologize if I don't uh, satisfy your expectations. And the last thing before starting with technical stuff, I want to say uh, thanks to all of those community mates who have been researching previously about software architecture on Go, from who I've learned a lot. So special thanks to Kat, Brian, Dave, and Marcus. Thank you very much. So yes, we can start <laughs> now, seriously. So uh, my partner and I start to write some code, and after p spending a few hours, we had something like that. Someone could say at least it has tests. <laughs> so as you can see, we decided to organize our application with a flat, flat approach, uh, where it has a file for its concept, which identified, we identified in the application, so models, database, handlers, etc. But we realized that on our first version, we are having very large files with a lot of business logic, uh, global variables everywhere. Also, we have all the stuff together on the main package, and so on. So we decided to separate each kind of logical concept uh, like storage, uh, model, services, etc., into a different package in order to isolate them and to split each, of, uh, each concept into several different files. For example, in the models package, we can have one file for each uh, model. Anyway, even though we separated each concept into a different package, we still had a bad feeling, it still uh, smelling. So we ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? The first thing we realized was that our code was hard to be tested. Then we realized that our code was very coupled, so hard to be changed. And finally, we realized that uh, our, our code was non-readable, so hard to be maintained. And we also had to face several uh, cyclic dependencies issues <laughs> that you are probably <laughs> uh, familiar with it. So then a common quote from Uncle Bob came to our minds, and it says, so if you want to go fast, if you want to get done quickly, if you want to your code to be easy to write, make it easy to read. And that was true, because we developed a fully functional alpha version of our applications by spending only a few hours. But we were really sure that coming features or future changes uh, will be hard to, to be done there. So we ask ourselves another question. What are really our goals? First one, as we want to be earning money for our entire life, <laughs> we want to be able to maintain our application with low efforts. Secondly, as we want uh, to beat our competitors to earn much more money, <laughs> We want to make our code scalable. That means being able to increase the performance hiring more developers, which is something easy to, to say, but not always to achieve. And finally, we also want uh, all of those de new developers that come to work with us uh, to start bringing value to the company as soon as possible. So our code has to be easy to read and easy to understand. OK, now we have our goals clearly defined. But after continuing with the talk, I also want to clarify that I was joking with a bit with those give about money. But the truth is that we have to be aware that mostly of us, we are working for companies whose owners or whose investors, uh, they don't want to have the best software architecture or the best uh, design patterns. They really want money. And that's why we get hard. So I think that it's something that it's commonly uh, forgotten by those exquisite developers 
who only want to work applying as much design patterns as possible uh, and making applications a lot of our engineering. And I will remind that fact over and over uh, during the talk. So after all of those reflections, we looked for a way to architecture our application in order to achieve the goals we have seen and some other researches. We decided to follow a layered architecture, but <laughs> not the oldest layered ar architecture known as model view controller or model view presentation. But uh, the one that is known as clear architecture or hexagonal architecture, also known as ports and adapters. And it basically consists on separating our application into three clearly defined layers, infrastructure, application, and domain. And as you can see, uh, the arrows define how the communication be be, uh, flows between the layers. And it basically consists on applying the immersion of control pattern to keep our domain, so the code that represents our business logic, uh, free of third party dependencies and external technology. This approach will let us achieve one of our goals because as our business logic will be isolated, it will be easily to, to be tested. Also, uh, there, uh, there will be uh, easily to be maintained. And also, uh, if we want to, to have to do a change, for example, uh, to change the network communications protocol from having an HTTP API, JSON API from a gRPC service, it will be easier to do it in this kind of architecture. And the same idea applies from some other changes like changing the persistence or some other implementation detail. But yeah, probably you're thinking, hey, Joan, <laughs> But how can I stick to my go code with uh, Xamarin Architect? Uh, but I don't really know what are you complaining about because there's also an already standardized structure way to, to organize your Go applications. It basically consists on having a CMD directory for all the entry points and also it also uh, contains a PKG or an internal directory where we will put all the source code of our application. So then, as we said that we have three layers, we can put each layer of this architecture in a different package inside this PKG or internal directory. But wait, <laughs> now is when Dave Cheney comes and say to you, name your package for it, what provides, not what it contains. <laughs> and the truth <laughs> is that when we hire new developers, they, they will open the, our applications projects and they will react like this guy. <laughs> what the hell does this application? <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> it's totally impre impredictable. So we can achieve our goals then we cannot earn money, <laughs> as we expected before. So our conclusion is hexagonal architecture can't be applied to a Go application. So neither domain nor in design. <laughs> we are sad, but at least we reach this conclusion. So that's all. That's time for questions. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's continue with our story. <laughs> supposed to be someone <laughs> asking, but not. Okay, so the next step we followed to evolve our application was applying what we named group by features architecture. So we changed a bit the way uh, we organized our packages. And here, just to clarify, I put all these packages inside uh, the PK, PKG or internal directory, but it it's uh, an aspect that, for me, it's not really an important uh, detail. So, as you can see, now its layer is clearly identified. I will see. I, I will show it now. First of all, we have to 
uh, we can identify those, those packages that corresponds to the infrastructure layer. And they are represented as nested packages. And the reason to do it is that we can see this kind of pattern in Go, uh, Go core libraries. Uh, because uh, as it happens in those packages that have uh, multiple representations, sorry, multiple implementations of the same concept. For example, we can see the encoding package that have multiple implementations, JSON, YAML, XML, etc. Or for example, the network communications uh, package that has HPC, uh, HTTP, RPC, etc. And that's precisely something common in, in the code related uh, with the infrastructure because we precisely can have uh, some implementations for our storage, for example, MySQL, Redis for a catch, or we can also have uh, multiple implementations for our server, so having uh, an HTTP JSON API, uh, also a gRPC service, etc. So that's why we represent those packages as nested packages. Then we have isolated the application layer related code into several different packages in order to let a new developer easily uh, see what features are already implemented and uh, to let it let he or she know where he has to uh, look for when he has to change something on, in our application so now it's clear clearly defined where where he have supposed to to fix something about creating new counters creating new users fetching data and so on and finally we have left the domain layer related code on the root so on the main package of our application in order to show clearly what are the key concepts of our application and to let it be free of dependencies, as you can see in, the, in this diagram. But probably most of you are thinking, okay, your talk is somehow related with domain drawing design and you've spent more than 15 minutes so far and there's nothing about domain drawing design. But I'm sorry, but if you are thinking that, uh, I have to say that I'm not really agree with you. And I think that the best way to, to show why I'm not agree uh, is seeing what really the mind is. So what is the mind drawing design? The mind drawing design is a term coined by Eric Evans in the book he published in 2004. And it rests on the fundamental idea that the most of the complexity in software lies in the domain, so in the business, and not in the technology. And that's why we should model our dom software by the, mo by the, dom the domain. Sorry. It's for complex needs. So remember what I said previously about our engineering our applications, because otherwise a kitty will die. <laughs> And its concepts are divided in two groups. The first group is called the strategic design, and it defines co some concepts about how we organize or who we do communications in our company. And the second group is called the tactical design, and it defines some com concepts more related with the code itself. So these will be the concepts that we will see more in deep in this talk. So let's start with these concepts. The first, concepts are, the first concept are the entities, uh, which are defined as an object defined primarily by its, by its identity. So they are self-contained objects. They should contain all the business logic related code. So they are a way, for example, to apply the tell don't ask principle. So we can ask to a counter to have incremented instead of using setter, setter, uh, setter method. Let's see an example. Here we can have our counter represented as a structure like this one. We can bring it uh, to a auto increment it by itself as a set. And we can also provide uh, a new factory pattern 
uh, method, as, as is common in, in Go, to, uh, to encapsulate some of our business uh, logic constraints. We can also uh, make, we can also go further and make some of its attributes uh, private in order to avoid someone incrementing, uh, for example, the value, uh, avoiding some of the business logic constraints. Another concept that it's also a business object is what we call value objects which are defined as objects that represent a descriptive aspect of the domain with no conceptual identity. So they are identified by its value, what implies that they should be immutable because when their value changes, they also change. Uh, in comparison, for example, with a counter, if we change the name of the counter, the counter, it it, it's still being the same counter. Uh, only with uh, another name, but if we have, for example, a price and we change the amount, we really have changed the, the price. It's not the same price. So we can see here an example. We can represent price, for example, with a structure like this one. And as you can see, we can provide both. Uh, another uh, new uh, method to instantiate this kind of value object and also uh, those methods that allows us to instantiate new value objects as a modification of the given one. For example, like in the add method and sub method. And yeah, I know that getter methods are not, are bad considered in Go community, but I think it's one way to, to solve the problems that we have currently with immutability. And if we want to go further, we can also uh, declare the structure as private and define it as an interface, for example, with the getter methods. And this would allow us to avoid creating uh, wrong uh, instances of these, these objects. Also, a third concept from the tactical domain during design are the repositories. That, a, that are also uh, known as the repository pattern, which basically consists an abstraction of our data persistence. So it tells us how, we'll, how we will communicate with the storage. And it basically defines an interface that will have many implementations. So for example, we can have a repository, uh, an interface repository like this one, uh, that will tell us how we will communicate with the counter storage. And then we can have uh, multiple implementations like this one. In this case, it's a, a simple in-memory implementation, but we can have multiple implementations for MySQL or whatever. And another concept are the services. More specifically, application service that basically corresponds to the application use case which are uh, a concept that we have al already implemented in the structure we have shown. So yes, we already have applied some of the domain driven design concepts so far, but we can go further, of course, because if we have a look again at this proposal, we can see field drawbacks on it. And <laughs> What are these, the, the drawbacks of this group by Features Architecture? Uh, the first one is that if we are developing a very large and complex application, rem uh, remember that otherwise we don't have to apply this kind of domain driven design concepts, uh, then the code related to the domain layer uh, can become very huge and become unmanageable. Imagine have, having a lot of models with its repositories, with its repository interfaces, etc. in our application. It could be hard to maintain also. Secondly, if we need to have more than one representation of a given entity, for example, uh, a user entity can be represented different in, in each context. 
for example, in, in the billing context, can have some attributes or some logic constraints, and in the counters context, can, can have some other attributes. Uh, if we have these needs, we will, this, this kind of architecture won't, won't scale because it will force us to, to use larger names and it will, it will become a bit messy. And lastly, uh, the application layer, so where we have our services or, or, or uh, use cases, has not well-defined boundaries. So it could also become chaotic for, uh, and not scalable. For example, if we have, let's say, the creating package with many services, there are create user, find user, create count, oh, sorry, uh, create user, create counter, create a, a new bill, etc. Then we are breaking the single responsibility solid, uh, solid principle at the package level. Otherwise, if we have a single service that is responsible of all the creating stuff, then we have to inject our repository implementations into this service, so it won't scale also, and it will also be chaotic to inject into a single service uh, all the repository implementations, the user ones, the counter ones, etc. So, what are uh, the next steps we can uh, do to uh, let this architecture evolve? Remember, when only when needed. Uh, we can apply a few more concepts from domain design design. The first one are the concept of models, what could be considered as a new split of our architecture. So keeping the same ideas uh, we, we have seen previously, but splitting each layer in a different module in order to avoid this kind of drawback, so having service isolated by, by entity, uh, and also to have the domain divided. Another one concept is uh, the bonded context con concept. So quite similar to the concept of modules, but this time with separated con context. So it will allow us to, to let a different team work for its con uh, con uh, context, sorry. And we, it will also allow us to have uh, different binaries or different applications or entry points for each context. And finally, we can introduce the concept of domain events, which is also from domain driven design. And you can think about domain events as something like a message queue or a stream. And of, of course, this uh, this concept can be applied in, a, in almost any stage of our evolution, but if we achieve this kind of uh, stage, where we have, for example, div different uh, bonded contexts, it will be a must to have a way to communicate be between each different uh, bonded context. Also, it will help us to apply the open, closed, solid principle by using the observer pattern and having to be able to extend the functionalities. For example, when one new user is registered, if we have to do more things, we won't have to modify the registration code itself. So just to conclude, we can see here what is a proposal about how to apply these concepts into a Go application. So the idea would be to have a different directory for each context on the root and then replicate the previously shown proposal on each of them. So having CMD and PKG directories for each context. And this uh, will allow us to have serrated services, serrated entities, as previously uh, I said. And having something like, like this a structure, probably you are realizing that it looks like mi microservices. So you can take into account its benefits, also <laughs> its drawbacks, of course. So I would say that that's all. Now, seriously. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. And now it's supposed to be time for questions, I guess. But unfortunately, <laughs> I think there's no remaining time. So feel free to reach us on Twitter or to ask me personally during the rest of the day. Thank you very much.